Good afternoon to everyone and welcome to our G clinical web series dedicated this month to musculoskeletal ultrasound. I'm Frederick Spagnoli, segment leader for G ultrasound, and I'm pleased today to introduce to you Dr. Gina Allen, who is consultant musculoskeletal radiologist and physician in St. Luke Hospital in Oxford, UK. She's going to talk to you today about high frequency imaging and microvascularization and how these new features improve her imaging capabilities in ultrasound. During the session, you can use the Q&A part to ask your question to Dr. Allen and she will answer directly at the end of the presentation. Now, I wish you a nice webinar and I'll hand over to Dr. Allen. Thank you and enjoy the session. Thank you, Fred. So welcome everyone. This afternoon I'm going to show you my experiences of GE's latest technology. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm a little different in the sense that I'm qualified in four specialties. Uh, I have qualifications in general family uh, medicine, in general medicine, radiology and sports medicine. And I use imaging very much as a diagnostic help to supporting my patients at St. Luke's Radiology. I also work in, another, uh, in other areas and I support medical students at the University of Oxford. I've written over 60 publications, most of which are on musculoskeletal ultrasound, and I act as MSK editor of a number of journals. So what is St. Luke's Radiology? Well, we are an independent musculoskeletal clinical radiology practice. We use MSK ultrasound for problem solving and guiding injections. And we like to think that we offer the best quality of imaging for our patients. So we're always seeking to update our imaging and also uh, look at the latest technology. We use ultrasound and MRI and CT for guided injections of the spine. And we use ultrasound for all our tendon and joint injections. We offer up-to-date techniques such as hyaluronic acid injections, PRP, high volume tendon stripping and dry needling. We've been collaborating with GE for many years and last year we had the privilege of looking at the new products for its ME1 and ME2 evaluation. We've seen the development and growth of this system and we've been able to input and see feedback from our input. We were due to see the system with a new L624D probe at the ECR in March, but sadly because of the coronavirus pandemic that wasn't possible. And so we decided that we'd take delivery of the new machine on Good Friday in April and we were able to look at it until June the 1st. Robina, who you can see in this uh, socially distanced image, is, has helped me install and set up the system. And she then helped me by uh, looking at the parameters on the machine. And we used the machine on both staff and patients to see its uh, excellent qualities. So when I'm looking for a machine for musculoskeletal ultrasound, we're looking not only for routine practical issues, but we're also looking for research dimensions. So the latest things that we need are better near field resolution to see maybe the smallest of nerves. We're looking for tendinosis at an early stage and near vascularization is key to this. We're looking for joints at depth and in our over, ever growing obese population, this is becoming more challenging. In fact, as they said recently, it wasn't just flattening of the curve for the coronavirus, but it was fattening of the curve. And I think many people have seen a problem with gaining weight over this period. We also want a machine that makes uh, injections as safe as possible and a machine that's easy to use. So when we were first using the uh, Logic E10, we have the MVI on our L818ID probe already. 
And this is what excited me because here we see a patient on the color Doppler image, there is no vascularity visible at all. But on the MVI image, you can see that there are blood vessels within the tendon, which perhaps make the diagnosis more apparent. This image is dear to my heart because this is my Achilles tendon when I was having problems. And on the ME2 assessment, so this is uh, the machine prior to the latest development, we did see more vascularity within the tendon and anterior to it on the MVI radiant flow, which was making me feel much better because at the time, I remember Rubina saying, I can't really see a lot. And I was saying, well, it really hurts and my tendon's really stiff, so there must be something to see. So this is the difference of the two, foam, two probes visually. When you're looking at the latest probe, the 624D, you can see it's smaller, and it's in the top of the image, and it's on the right of the lower image. It's more ergonomic. It's lighter to hold than the other probe. But what you can see very obviously from this image, the uh, foot plate is narrower, and this makes access to small areas easier. And there's much better resolution at both the near and far fields of the probe. Now, those of you who have a Logic E10 may now be feeling very depressed because if you've just bought one of these uh, machines, you may wonder whether there's any advantage in just going with the probes you already have. And I just want to show you in the next few images uh, the differences just with speckle reduction imaging on this new uh, upgrade if you want it. So normally we don't really look at images in this way. Normally we just use the machine uh, day in, day out. We have one patient after another and we don't have the time to actually look at the differences when we try different settings. So what we did with our conventional probe, which we have, the L818ID probe, we looked at the new speckle reduction versus the old. And here, this is meant to be an equivalent speckle reduction. So we have uh, a speckle reduction of seven on the right and the old speckle reduction of two on the left. And I hope you can see a difference in these images. So what I noticed, there was sharper detail of the joint cartilage on the new parameter. And there was also a sharper outline of tendon and median nerve. So what if we set the speckle reduction at the highest preset? On the old system, that would be a four. And we were then comparing it to the middle range, so the SRI of seven on the new. And I think it's really very similar. The image doesn't really show that much difference in the joint cartilage the tendon or the median nerve. Then when we look at the highest setting of speckle reduction on both the old settings and the new settings, so now we're calling them four and nine, we notice on the nine, the image is almost too smooth. And for me, I find this just a little too blurry. I think you lose some detail of the tendon and the median nerve. Overall, I felt that the new SRIs improved my image quality to such a degree that when I started using the probe again after having the latitude of using the better probe, I felt that I was losing some detail on my old settings. So this is the new probe, this L624D, and here we can see the uh, speckle reduction is labeled one to four, which is what it's set on the new upgrade. And you can see a slight difference between the images. What it comes down to with this digital nerve is I think it depends on what you like to look at. I still felt the images were much better than with the other probe, but I tend to favor number two, because again, I fail number four is a little too smooth. So then when we were looking on the old machine, uh, old without the upgrade, we wanted to know what really the differences were between the different Dopplers. And I suspect many of you will know the differences, but I'll just recap what we're looking at. 
So the conventional Doppler uses flow volume and direction. Wall filters are used to reduce artifact from movement, removing low flow data. And it can detect image vessel size of more than 0.1 millimeters in diameter. Power Doppler sonography displays the strength of the Doppler signal on color rather than the speed and direction information. It has three times the sensitivity of conventional color Doppler and is often used by rheumatologists in looking for flow in joints. It looks for detection of flow. Sorry, it has sensitivity, increased sensitivity for direction of flow, and therefore it's particularly useful for these small vessels and for low velocity flow. So what advantage does the microvascular Doppler give you? Well, microvascular imaging is an optimized sub-mode of power Doppler imaging, and it uses continuous whole frame data acquisition of low pulse repetition combined with GE-coded excitation technology to achieve slow flow sensitivity, giving you higher spatial resolution and fast frame times. So here we see the addition of radiant flow with our new upgrade. Here we see the arcade of the vessels into the subcutaneous tissues are more clear on the MVI and stand out in the image. What we also noticed when we were looking at this MVI is it gives you some artifacts. Now I think on the newer upgrade this is improved, but when we were first looking at it we were very taken with this bright on bright. What it shows is bone interfaces. And actually, it can be used to enhance visualization of some structures, such as this bony fragment in a joint. So as long as you know that's what it's about, it can actually be a useful addition. Here we're looking at the superior resolution in all structures of the L624D in Guillaume's canal. And when we were looking with the radiant flow MVI, you could see the superior detail, but also this tiny, tiny vessel, which we confirm with pulse wave. What you'll notice is there is a new color scheme also on this new machine. So we've gone from gray to purple. And I think this also makes it more apparent where the flow is. Here we see another tiny vessel. So with the color Doppler, we couldn't see any flow in this small vessel, but on the MVI, we can see, confirmed by pulse wave, that there is a tiny vessel. And this may become important, and I hope over the cases I'm going to show you, you'll see why. This shows you the superior uh, aspect of showing the anatomy with the new probe. So I'm using different presets again, and the two, the SRI2, I think, shows very nicely the tendon, the flexor tendon, and the A4 pulley, which doesn't want to show. There you go. We can also see the A1 pulley transversely here in much more detail than any other probe I've used. And this makes it much more conspicuous. This could enable us to see abnormalities in more detail. Here I'd like you to look at the flexor tendons of the little finger. And what we're seeing on the left-hand side of your image is there is an additional flexor tendon. In the literature, we know that there are accessory flexor tendons but I don't think I've ever appreciated such a tendon in so much detail. You can see it as a separate tendon coming all the way down into the finger. This is likely to be a small accessory dig uh, flexor digitorum profundus. Here we can see superior detail of the uh, superior perineal retinaculum. Here we see the cartilage meniscus that attaches it to the bone. 
why is it important? Well, because when you're looking at injuries to this site, you need to be able to tell whether the cartilage has been injured or whether indeed it's just a retinacular injury. Type 1 injuries are the most common where the retinaculum gets peeled off. And depending on how severe the injury is, depends on whether surgery is needed. We see a lot of ankle injuries in our practice. So this may be invaluable if we can detect more um, significantly the injury that is involved. So in an ankle sprain, as I said, which is a common uh, diagnosis, we need to identify all the soft tissue injuries. It's good to be able to see the small avulsion fractures because these are often missed on plain radiography. And ultrasound is key to assessing the source of a clicking because we can use dynamic assessment. With my machine, with this L889D probe, I get adequate detail and I can detect all of these. But does the L624D with radiant flow MVI make things easier? Well, case one I'd like to tell you about is a 20-year-old who slipped and fell while walking five years ago. She had a definite anterior tibiofibular ligament rupture at this first event, and this was shown both clinically and ultrasound confirmation. Sadly, she'd also had a previous anterior Taylor fibular ligament injury before this. The power of physiotherapy proved that she didn't need any surgery and she got back to sport, but she's also always had a feeling of tightness on vigorous exercise. She's a member of our staff, and so we looked at her ankle for the evaluation of this machine rather than to see any specific problem for treatment. So here we see with the new probe, there is thickening of the anterior tibiofibular ligament, and there's a small area of hyacogenicity, which I've arrowed. This may be the result of a previous avulsion fra fragment, but at this stage, five years down the line, it could also be an area of fibrosis or scarring. Here we see the difference between the two probes. And on the left, you can see that there's a little blurring of a thickened anterior Taylor fibula ligament, which is intact, but obviously abnormal from the previous injury. On the right with the new probe, you can see much more detail within the ligament. And this may be important if she has a re-injury. With the perineal retinaculum, the old probe, we can just see thickening of the area. And on the uh, new probe on the right, we can see this in more detail. So we're still appreciating there is a problem with both probes. There's obviously been a type 2 injury of this retinaculum and there's continued thickening. She never had any clicking or subluxation of the tendons and has never really complained in this area. So this new probe shows more detail, but perhaps this wouldn't have made much difference in diagnostics. Here I'm going to show you a video clip of that just to show you again the difference of the retinaculum overall. And this is using the L624D probe. So because she's been a patient as well as a colleague in our practice, we actually have images of the original, Im uh, original injury in 2015 when the images were performed on a Logic E9 machine. And here, hopefully, you can see the difference in the detail. What was interesting at this point in time, the perineal retinacular injury was not detected. So there's always a question whether she's actually had this injury since the original injury. But there was a definite defect in the anterior tibiofibular ligament and a large ankle joint effusion, which we discovered in a study of 100 patients is actually not a significant just for bony involvement of the ankle in these sprains, but can occur when you have significant ligamentous injury. Case two appeared as a patient while we were trialing the machine, and he was a 19-year-old 
who'd rolled his ankle eight weeks before playing football. He had immediate pain and swelling at the time. He had bruising several days later, which didn't resolve with icing and elevation. And he sought advice and had an X-ray in the emergency department, braving the coronavirus. He was still in pain and had swelling and weakness with a lateral clicking sensation. And he was given online physiotherapy, which didn't help anything. He wanted to know what was really happening to his ankle because this would make a difference as to whether the physiotherapy would be changed. Did he have a ligament damage? Did he have a bony damage? And what was the cause of clicking? So what we discovered that he'd injured his, talo, his calcaneofibular ligament. And using the new probe, you can see that there is change within the ligament. There is low echogenicity and thickening. And there's also vascularity, which we know denotes that unless somebody's had an old injury within the last year, this is likely to be a new injury. Here we can see he's also torn his anterior talar fibular ligament. So you can see an intact ligament from his other ankle, just to show you the difference. But you can see a defect in the uh, ligament here. And you can also see the vascularity. I think you can see more vascularity with the radiant flow MVI. And this extends into the joint as well as through the defect of the ligament. He was also getting this clicking. And we could see that he had an intact perineal retinaculum. But he had pseudo subluxation of his perineal tendons, which you can clearly see on this video clip. So we were able to reassure him that this wasn't a surgical problem and hopefully would resolve with time. The case, next case I'd like to show you is a 60-year-old female lady who came with severe base of thumb pain, again a patient. Because she had terrible pain, she couldn't self-care anymore. She couldn't even go to the toilet to dress herself. She had a previous left equivalence tenosynovitis on a background of Parkinson's disease, which had become more severe of late. The question was, was this a joint problem or was it a tenosynovitis? She came to us because her family doctor had performed an unguided injection. I'm not quite sure whether this was in the tendon or in the joint, but she'd had no response. So what we discovered was the decoyer veins tenosynovitis. Here we see with the L624D probe, there's tenosynovitis of the extensor pollicis brevis and abductor pollicis longus with ectasia of the tendon sheath and fluid and thickening. When we put the Doppler on, we can see with color Doppler, there is color Doppler signal around the tendons more so than within the tendons. But on the MVI with radiant flow, you can see there's more vascularity within the tendon itself. So perhaps making you think that this is more severe than previously. We were then able to guide an injection directly into this tendon sheath. And here you can see the needle coming in from the right. And you get very good conspicuity of the needle with this probe. Case four was a similar lady. So she was a 59 year old lady with severe base of right thumb pain. And so the question then was, was it joint or was it tendon? But she also said at the time of the examination, she had tingling in her thumb, index and middle fingers, which was worse at night. What we were able to see was this wasn't a tendon problem, but a severe osteoarthritis of the carpal metacarpal joint of the thumb. And with the vascularity, we can see, again, the difference between the color Doppler on the left and the power Doppler on the right. 
sorry, in the MVI on the right. Her median nerve was also looked at because given the symptoms, we were wondering about carpal tunnel syndrome. With the image at the top, you can see much more detail within the median nerve compared to the image with the older probe. What we could confirm is she does have carpal tunnel syndrome because not only is the, is the median nerve enlarged, but there's also this hourglass appearance with tapering of the nerve as you go into the carpal tun tunnel under the flexor retinaculum. Here you can see with the colour Doppler there was no flow at all, but with the MVI with radiant flow there was some flow. Now admittedly for those of you who are used to looking at carpal tunnel syndrome you'll notice that there is an additional vessel there probably which is a persistent median artery, but there is also flow within the median nerve itself. And this correlates with a severity of compression. So often we see this if the compression has been ongoing over a period of time. So would our new probe be any better for looking at inflammatory arthritis? So again, during the coronavirus um, lockdown, many people have not been given this diagnosis because many of our lists have been stopped. But this was a lady who was, um, one of our patients was in great, had great problems. And so what are the challenges of inflammatory arthritis? Well, what we'd like to think is our new probe would show us earlier joint disease, synovitis, neovascularity within the joints, and, and give us erosions or show us erosions at an earlier phase. This makes a big impact on treatment. And although we're still learning about ultrasound in inflammatory arthritis, we use it a lot in our practice to look for these problems. We use our L818 ID probe and we think it's very good for detecting small joint disease. But what we discovered, and I'll show you with the next case, is perhaps the new probe is even better. So now on to the patient. So this lady is only 38. Her living is a, is a portrait painter, so her hands are very, very important. And over this period of time, she developed pain, swelling and stiffness in both her hands and her feet. And this has been going on now for several months. She developed a swollen right wrist, her dominant hand, and she's developed two lumps, one on the index finger of her right hand and one on the little finger of her left hand. She did a Zoom uh, consultation with a rheumatologist privately because she was so concerned. And she was uh, asked to, take, um, to get an ultrasound of her joints, and that's how she contacted us. So the question is, were these lumps soft tissue or bone? And was this indeed an inflammatory arthropathy, a new diagnosis? So here on the left, we can see the image that we would have had with our old probe. And what we're seeing here is just a small area of high echogenicity within the joint. So for me, I wouldn't have been able to say whether this was um, anything other than perhaps a small loose body or a bit of fibre and debris, I wouldn't have been able to give her her diagnosis. On the right, however, you can see that there is a spicule of bone extending from the uh, bone into the joint cavity and there's also vascularity around it. So this makes it an erosion rather than a small entity within the joint. This was also confirmed with the MVI. So the MVI on the old probe showed us peripheral vascularity, but on the new probe, we were able to see that there was vascularity extending into the joint and up into the erosion. The other area where she had a lump, there was synovitis. 
there was some vascularity but not as florid and perhaps an early erosion. So this is the image with the new probe only, but I hope you can see that the cortex of the bone is slightly irregular. All in all, both of these lumps were actually joint-based and not soft tissue. So this made a big difference to her diagnosis. The other lump on the back of her wrist turned out to be a ganglion. So that was a little reassuring that it wasn't more synovitis. And this, again, was something we put forward to the rheumatologist. We also did x-rays of both hands, and these were completely normal. So when I'm guiding intervention, I'm asking a question of the machine, as we have before. But the additional one is, will this machine make my percutaneous injection safer? And this is something all of us should ask, because the more intervention you do, the more um, small areas that you look at. I'm trying to place needles in smaller areas, and I'm trying to do uh, more intricate injections to help my patients. So this is a big question, isn't it? Is this new probe of ours going to help us perform needle intervention? Is it going to make it easier? Is it going to make it safer? Is it going to allow me to see structures more clearly? Is it going to allow me to see the needle better? What I was finding is that I could see small vessels and nerves adjacent to small joints. So this probe is fantastic in the near field of small areas, such as the hands and feet. It was able to see fine detail of the A1 pulley, as we showed earlier. I've never seen so much detail in the near field using another probe. And the needle looks larger than it really is. So again, you could say that that would help with intervention. My next case is a patient with an arthritic ankle joint. And normally I would use a larger probe. I wouldn't necessarily use a small footprint probe in order to assess the ankle. But I just thought I'd look and see whether it improved uh, matters. And here we can see the anatomy in so much detail. What I hadn't appreciated is how many vessels were going to be in my way when I did the ankle injection. You can see the needle approaching the ankle joint at the top. It's coming in transversely, and here you can see the fluid within the ankle joint that I've injected. So this was safely done using this uh, probe and this technique. This was a patient who had locking of his middle finger. He'd waited for months and months. He sought advice from a surgeon just before lockdown, and then was very um, keen not to do anything in view of the advice to stay at home. But because the lockdown's gone on and on, he decided he couldn't carry on because he is a manual worker and he needs his finger to do his job. And he was hoping once the lockdown had been lifted, he would be back and fully functioning to do his job. So he contacted us. On the left hand image, we can see this is with the uh, L889i probe. And the flexor tendon now sadly looks a little blurry. We can see that there is some hold up. It's not running as smoothly as it should do. On the right hand image with the new probe, the L624D, you can see clearly there's a nodule within the tendon, which I think is not so easy to see on the other image. Here we went ahead and did intervention. So we decided that we would release his A1 pulley. And here the injection of the anaesthetic is going in on the left. And my needle's being passed back and forwards on the right through the A1 pulley. So it's breaking down this A1 pulley to free the tendon. Here we can see that the uh, image is in transverse. And what I wanted to show that the A1 pulley was absolutely the target of my needle. So I look in transverse, and you can see that the needle is bobbing up and down within the A1 pulley. Obviously, it's important to know where the needle tip is. So this wouldn't be the direction that I would do the intervention in. 
but it just confirmed that I was just right down the middle of this A1 pulley and I wouldn't have any difficulty in cutting anything else with my cutting needle. Here we can see the image pre-release with the nodule in the tendon and I can show you that it's not running very easily. On the right hand image this is post procedure and unfortunately of course we've used a lot of local anaesthetic now so the image will be a little slow because he was finding it difficult to move his finger due to the anaesthetic block but I hope you can see that it is moving more freely and he himself felt that it was a successful procedure at that point. So in conclusion, I hope I've shown you over the last few cases that the L624D probe with Radiant Flow MVI has improved my imaging capability in seeing near field structures and early vascularity. And I think both of these have helped me in diagnostics and therapeutics. It's also improved my capability of seeing the needle, which is very important when I'm doing near field um, interventions. In fact, one thing I would say, if any of you are going to use this probe, it makes intervention rather more scary because you see so many more structures in your way that perhaps you hadn't appreciated before. You're then dodging things that perhaps you wouldn't have even tried to dodge before. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Allen, for this nice presentation and for all your clinical and technical explanation. I think through your uh, experience with the new high frequency probes combined to radiant flow and MVI technology, we clearly learned many clinical benefits of these techniques in musculoskeletal investigation. So now, in order to continue the discussion with our participant today, let's open the Q&A session. We received already some, some questions regarding the topic. So let's start with the first one. So there is a first question for you. Is the new probe same frequency as old probe? So no, the, the new probe is giving you uh, much more near field resolution because it's running um, at its nearest 24 megahertz rather than 18 megahertz. Um, and it's giving you a deeper penetration because it's six rather than eight. Mm. Thank you for the, the clarification on this point. The second question is, did you recommendations of cortisone infiltration evolved since the appearance of the microvascular techniques sooner, later, in function of the kinesiotherapeutic response. So I'd say that the MVI has allowed us to confirm the diagnosis in tendon disease earlier. Uh, the patient's clinical assessment is also very important, however, so we should never treat patients unless we have clinical correlation. And with the MVI, what I would say is that there may be a learning curve in some areas. So we may be seeing vascularity in things that we didn't see before, which is normal. And this is something also related to the activity that our patient does. So we already know that sometimes tendons have vascularity because somebody's using that tendon much more, perhaps in a sport such as basketball, the patella tendon. Um, they may be asymptomatic, but they may have findings. So this is something to be aware of. I would say that we don't always use steroids in our practice. In fact, the use of steroids is going down and down because we so have so many other techniques. And elite sports steroids are a real problem because it's banned by WADA. So um, patients, if they need steroids, they would have to have an exemption certificate. Yeah. There are a lot of other techniques that we can use without even going there. And we don't really uh, like using steroid and weight-bearing tendons. So such as the Achilles, we wouldn't use a steroid injection adjacent to that. What we would want to do is we would want to work alongside our physiotherapists in getting somebody 
good rehab before we think about cortisone. So it's a bit more complex than your perhaps the question posed. In other words, I think the MVI um, flow is going to be really interesting in seeing early disease. Mm -hmm. And that might, in fact, help us push patients earlier into physiotherapy. So sometimes when you look at a tendon, you don't see much, and the, ten and the patient is complaining. So you know that the tendon must be a problem if that's where you clinically think the problem is. But if you know that there's vascularity, you could then perhaps use that, A, to endorse the fact that there is a diagnosis of the thing you were thinking. But if you were following them up and looking after physiotherapy and making a decision at what point to do intervention, that would be very useful because then you've got a baseline and you can move forward from it. For some treatments, if you've got no vascularity, you would be questioning what you would be doing. So, for example, in the Achilles, we use saline stripping in our practice. Some people use uh, polydocanol injections of the vessels. And the reason being they're trying to decrease those vessels in order to decrease the pain fibers that go along with them in order to allow you to do your physiotherapy. If you can't see any vessels, then obviously you can't treat them. So for those patients, you probably would find the MVI fantastic because if you're not winning with physiotherapy and they've got lots of pain, you could use the MVI radiant flow to show us these vessels that were no, weren't visible previously. So yeah, it makes a big impact on that. But in joint disease, I think it's a completely different ball game because I've shown you a case and I was just stunned that this patient Previously, I thought my imaging was excellent with my machine, with my Logic E10. And I thought my L818i D probe was fantastic. And now I've just shown myself that actually I would have missed an erosion. Um, and perhaps I would have noticed a synovitis, but not the as much vascularity. But I think now with this new probe, it's going to make those diagnoses even earlier. And that's going to be of great benefit to patients because we all know with inflammatory arthritis, some of them, if you don't get treatment early, you may actually stop them having effective treatment. Okay, thank you for the, for the points. We have another question. Uh, have you made any diagnosis that would not have been detected without the system? So again, the inflammatory arthropathy, um, I would say that we've seen more detail. So perhaps, you know, if you're looking at a problem where there is an accessory tendon or a normal variant, sometimes these things can be symptomatic. That would make a difference in your diagnostics. Um, the fact that you can see vascularity earlier, that would definitely make a difference in your diagnostics in some cases, not all, but certainly things near the, the skin surface, um, tendons in the near field. So yes, I would say that the short while we had the probe, um, we would have definitely, well, we definitely benefited during that time. And I must also say I've missed it since I haven't had it. So that's always a very good sign, isn't it? If somebody takes away a new toy and you think, OK, well, actually, now I'm back to normal and really it hasn't made a difference. Um, it has made a difference. So yes, it has made a difference in my practice. Okay. Next question is about patient management. How is the technique affecting your management of patients with MSK disorders? So a little the same, but um, I suppose that means um, using the vascularity, using uh, using the MVI with radiant flow, using the new probe. I would add in beyond that also the new parameters. So what I'm looking forward to, um, if we get the upgrade, is I'm looking forward to seeing the impact on the other things that I mentioned. So will it mean that we can see more at depth, for example, with the other probes? Will it mean um, that we've seen more overall, so not just near field with another new probe, but making a difference with the machine we've already got, the probes we've already got. 
and from my small experience over six weeks I think again yes because we look back and we're looking we do a lot of shoulder scanning which I haven't shown you because we do that with the ML probe that we have um, and because we can see with ML 512 isn't it so we're doing scanning at a different depth and the imaging that I was doing with the new presets were definitely clearer and were better diagnostically. Now, to only time would tell, and you, you'd have to do assessments between the two parameters to know whether it made a big difference. But surely, if you think you're seeing things better, that's got to be a good thing um, for any, any diagnostician, seeing better is better for the patient. Mm -hmm. Okay. The next question is regarding the wrist investigation. Have you compared this probe with the matrix on the wrist? Matrix probe is the MLC. So it, MLC is this the, the matrix probe, the ML yes, this um, probe that we're talking about now? Okay. So, yes. So, I still use the uh, matrix probe when I'm looking across the wrist. So if I want a bigger field of view, of course the matrix probe is excellent because I need to see the whole area, the, the landmarks when I'm looking overall. But I use the foot probes then to cone down on little areas of abnormality. So whichever foot probe you've got, you will get more detail when you're looking perhaps at the uh, finger tendons or the pulleys the nerves, you will get more detail than you will with your matrix probe. So I wouldn't be without them, uh, the matrix probe, I would definitely want that even for uh, wrist scanning. But for example, today I looked at a wrist and I was using my matrix probe to do the initial diagnostics. I then went on to my foot probe to look in more detail. And then I used my foot probe in order to do my intervention. So I did an, a joint injection, an arthrogram in the wrist under ultrasound guidance before this lady had a CT. And um, the combination of the matrix and foot probe in my practice is really uh, what I need. Okay. And we have a last question regarding muscle. Is new probe can help us to diagnose muscle tumor with sensitivity reached ninety percent. Well, that will be lovely, but I think no ultrasound, unfortunately, can give us all that information. So, having worked in one of the largest tumor centres in Europe at one point in my career, um, ultrasound is very good at telling us whether something cystic solid and very good at perhaps pushing us in the right direction but we would have still in the majority of cases um, probably done MRI and also biopsy so ultrasound unfortunately cannot give you a fantastic um, fantastically accurate diagnosis in muscle tumors you have to have the histology you can't just use imaging where ultrasound have is brilliant for doing uh, muscle tumor diagnosis, it can show you a good place to biopsy. So when you look at your MRI, MRI, you may not appreciate the areas that are cystic and solid as easily. And when I was doing biopsies under ultrasound guidance, I would be able to show where a good place to biopsy was. And then we would perhaps take several biopsies in slightly different locations, but to make sure that we didn't miss the area that was most significant. Because if you take a biopsy in a necrotic cystic area, your diagnostics are not going to be as good. The histologist is perhaps not going to get as good a sample of that tumour. Um, so yeah, your new probe will probably be brilliant for looking at lumps and bumps in the hands and feet, um, because it will give you more detail, definitely because it's giving you not only, as I said, the resolution in the near field, but it's also giving you a bit more depth. So again, a patient I saw yesterday, I was really wishing I had that probe because I just wanted a bit more refinement at depth, um, which unfortunately, 
the matrix probe didn't quite give me it didn't give me that crispness of resolution of cystic versus solid um, so I think it really depends on what practice you have as to whether this new probe is so important to you and for us with what we do um, I think it will be a great adjunct okay Thank you very much, Dr. Allen, to share with us your uh, experience with the new probes and system, and also for your time to answer to these different questions. Thank you so much for that. Now, the webinar session is over. So thank you for your attending to all, your, all the participants. I wish you a nice evening and see you soon for the next clinical session. Thank you and good evening. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you.